Black Cat Lounge is sponsored by Paranormal Oddities, The Little Store with the Big Heart, Dragonfly Art and Soul, Paraniagara, where the real ghosts of Lockport hang out, Wild Raven Candles for those magical times, Queen of Tarts, Metaphysical and Bake Shop. and welcome back to the Black Cat Lounge. It's Tuesday night. Where the hell else would you be except here, hanging out with yours truly? Why? Because I used to be a superstar. Now I just play one on TV. Well, I don't even do that anymore. Now I just play one down in my basement because, you know, you know how it is. You know, your brain shuts down every so often, you know, and that's, that's just the way it works. Anyway, guys, listen, I want to just do a quick update with you guys to let you know that Winifred, my Labrador, is a Labrador. You guys all know we had her CCL repaired last week, and uh, uh, it's, uh, or I shouldn't say last week, last December, and last night, she or yesterday morning, she jumped off the deck, and she re-injured it. Well, she's working, and she's getting, you know, she's getting it all back in, and uh, she's getting better, but we're going to have that checked out just to be on the safe side, because I need her to be like my you know, my adventure pal when I'm out there on the road. So she's doing better, but she'll leave. But I just want to let everybody know because everybody was kind of concerned. Hey, happy, happy Ostara, happy, happy spring. Welcome. I can't wait. This is, I am so excited for this year because of the fact that I have so many things planned and we are it's, it, within, within like two weeks, a week, maybe a week, I'm going to be at a, a location in Pennsylvania uh, and that we can't wait to we can't go and I'm, or I can't wait to get out there and we'll have a good time. Anyway, really quickly. Uh, yes. Again, uh, I had the, uh, my paranormal pack knocked off the shelf in the basement. Uh, it's one of those things that happen. I don't, you know, it's one of those things that just, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no reason for it. Um, it's, it's hard to pull it out cause I have it sandwiched between some gear and, uh, I don't know. Of course, on the other side of this, on the other side of this laptop, the other side of the, the camera, uh, are is you know a room full of haunted objects and stuff of that nature. So it's not that far out of the realm of possibilities. So it's one of those things. I have to also quickly say that Saturday night we had an ITC seance session. Um, it was a private affair. Same people that usually show up showed up, and um, at one point somebody asked. Uh, why won't you talk to us? And through uh, a Panasonic R60, we got the clearest EVP that I have heard in probably over 10 years, over a decade. And it's, I won't talk. It was amazing. It was just an amazing, amazing uh, uh, EVP. So didn't want to talk. It happens, you know. What, what can I say? I, if I were you, I wouldn't talk. <laughs> you know? But anyway, tonight, welcome once again to our great Victoria, our March Victorian madness. And yet, and by the way, no, this is not a Nehru collar for those of you that grew up in the 70s like I did. This is more of a this is more of a civil war, uh, uh, more more of a civil war military vest that I decided to uh, wear. And I put my pipe in my pocket here so that everybody doesn't think that I'm a holy roller here and that I am, that I'm using my credentials, which I refuse to do. Hey, so anyway, guys, I'm so thrilled that you're here. But our guest tonight, I am, I got to tell you what, I wanted to talk to somebody about tonight's subject for the longest time. And I kept thinking to myself, who could I ask, you know? And well, to be honest with you, one day I was in Gettysburg and I had my thumb out and said, you know, I will go go ghost hunting for food. And this dude picked me up and I didn't realize that he had a phenomenal, just a phenomenal uh, uh, 
shop. He's a phenomenal artist. And he does, I'm going to say it wrong, so Dave, don't yell at me. Don't yell at me, Dave. I can't say, I practiced it too. I'll just say wet plate photography for now. And uh, he's an artist. He's a true artist. And the process itself that he practices is as close to what you're going to find from the 1860s in this modern age. It is just an amazing, he's, it's just an amazing art form. And when you go and you look at these photographs, you can, it's its just not like a flat photograph, you know, get take grab your, you know, DSLR and just go and take a shot or whatever, you know, and you, yeah, you can get some great stuff. But I always look at these photographs and I always say to myself, my God, this is almost looking into a person's soul. It gives them such a rugged look of natural lighting. Uh, it, it's just a beautiful, beautiful art form. And this gentleman has developed to a very high. So guys, please welcome the man, the myth, the legend. That's the only way I can describe him. You know what? I wish I was P.T. Barnum because I know he would have the proper words to describe. Please welcome Dave Wilson to the Black Cat Lounge. Dave, how are you? Thank you, sir, for coming in. I am so thrilled that you're here. More than you... Listen, Dave, Dave, I get excited over a lot of things. And as you can tell, I am a collector. Mm -hmm. And your work, the, the photographs that, I, that you've done of me are probably my most prized possessions in my collections so it's just it's just amazing and i i think i would i think i was blessed the day that i ran into you you know <laughs> so it was great but let, let's just let's just start right up with uh how did you get in what was your interest well how did you get into uh doing uh what like photography i mean because I'm really interested in your backstory. You know, I know what you do. I know some of the stuff about some stuff about you. You know, you're a crazy oddities person like me. Mm -hmm. But what really, what was that thing that really got you interested in doing this? So first, um, it's pronounced collodion. <laughs> collodion. Oh my god, collodion. Yeah, dude, yeah. dude. I went and I I practiced it. And one of those days, <laughs> it's just one of those days that I'm so tongue tied I can't pronounce it. But I I'm glad, I'm glad one of us can. Yeah, yeah. I better be able to pronounce it. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So I've got a um, kind of interesting background when it comes to photography, in that I don't have a background in photography. Um, I never went to school for it. I never took any classes for it. They didn't even offer it in my high school, and um, I was never really that interested in it as like an art form. Mm -hmm. I did a lot more uh, in like the musical world. Um, however, I was very interested in the American Civil War, um, dating all the way back to like first grade. Uh, I grew up in the Quad Cities, uh, which is the town that's split by the Mississippi River in Illinois and Iowa. Um, and so for, I want to say a first grade field trip, we went to the Rock Island Arsenal, Rock Island, Illinois. And on the Rock Island Arsenal, there's a Confederate cemetery because it was a uh, it was a prison camp there during the Civil War. And so that really piqued my interest in uh, history and the American Civil War. And it, we just it just took off from there. And I've always been interested in it. Um, I became a reenactor in high school and uh, got my image struck by a handful of practicing wet plate artists. Um, Chloe Levette, uh, Todd Harrington, Rob Gibson, um, a lot of a lot of the old guys who, who did it a long time ago. Uh, Bob Zabo, a bunch of those guys. Um, and so it was always something I was familiar with, but had never practiced or really thought that I would practice it. Um, and then when my wife and I moved to Gettysburg back in 2015, um, we moved too far away from the ice rink that I was working at and, uh, I needed something else to do. And I took a friend of mine to, uh, Dell and Tish's studio in Gettysburg and they casually mentioned that they would be retiring soon and they were looking for somebody to take over. And I thought, you know, I could probably do this. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. That's amazing. And it's, I, I, you know what? I pegged you as a reenactor. I'm not going to lie. I, mean, I, I, pe I pegged you right off the bat. You know, you were just, you're just too natural in the, in the time period and you get a chance to go and, and hang out. First question real quickly. I got from 
uh, my buddy Chris, who, and Chris Coppola is the owner of Six Order Tattoo here in uh, in uh, Lancaster, New York, and he is a, he is a he's he's a world class artist too. And he, the question is, is this gentleman local? Of course, we know that you're not local, but we'll talk about that. Uh, I have a an a 11 by 14 banquet camera. I want to I want to play with. So, uh, tell you can you can tell him basically where you are, and, and maybe uh, someday we'll all hook up. Sure thing. So, um, uh, well, my studio location is in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I currently live in uh, Phelps, New York, just north of Geneva, um, right off of Seneca Lake. Um, so I'm pretty close to like Canandaigua in that area. It's just southeast of Rochester, uh, about 30 minutes or so. Um, I've hosted a handful of workshops at my uh, at my farm. I've got a studio there. And um, I also host workshops down at my Gettysburg location. And um for uh, uh for you know as far as distance goes i don't mind traveling places to do workshops and work with cameras so um i'll be going to connecticut and philadelphia this year teaching workshops and i think also delaware's on the list awesome so that's, i get around a little bit <laughs> that's awesome hey could you explain to everybody how the process actually works because you know in this day and age everybody is so first of all you get somebody like me who brought up who got who was brought up with the polaroids and and you know your Kodak Instamatics, and then begrudgingly moved on to you know SLRs and that sort of thing. You know, uh, that's not at all what you, how you work. I mean, no. Tell everybody uh -huh. how. I mean, because to me, watching you, you are two steps away from an alchemist. I'm just gonna right. lie. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm. The, I watched the process and was totally amazed. So tell everybody kind of how it works. Right. So, yeah, it's almost more chemistry than photography. Um, basically, uh, it's photography in its most analog form. Um, I start with a blank tin plate um, and onto that tin plate, I pour a chemical emulsion, uh, which is made of collodion, ether and grain alcohol. Um, so essentially, that is like a, a halide suspension. Um, it's also going to have uh, a couple of um, photographic salts in it. Um, I mainly use cadmium bromide, ammonium bromide, and potassium iodide. Those are my big ones. Um, iodide brings out contrast, whereas bromide brings out midtones. So for different times of year, different types of light, maybe even different times of day, um, I'll have different recipes on hand to kind of deal with, you know, overpowering light or not enough light. Um, that solution is poured on that tin plate and then it is dunked in a bath of silver nitrate um silver nitrate reacts with sunlight and uh it blackens and it turns dark um so all the way back to ancient greek chinese roman times people were using silver nitrate to do like sun drawing and stuff like that um and so people have always known it's got some sort of photographic properties to it so in the 1830s when they're trying to figure out how to make photography they know that silver tarnishes with sunlight and so that's kind of always been the basis for it so that plate that's been saturated with collodion is now going to sit in that silver nitrate for a couple minutes until it becomes photosensitive um, then it's taken out of the bath of silver and put into either a film holder or a shuttle box or something something to get it from the dark room to the back of the camera um, once it's put in the back of the camera a dark slide is pulled up so that the plate is ready to be exposed inside the camera the camera itself is really just a sliding box and a lens um, the lens from the time period is is a three-tiered pets fall lens and we can go into that a little bit later but it's a portrait lens that has a really strong sharp focal point and then it kind of loses a little bit on the edges um, and so that's why you get that kind of like swirly bokeh type look to it um, um, so once you have uh, placed the plate in there and you're ready to shoot then you open the lens cap for however many seconds it needs to be uh, obviously modern cameras take a quick snap as far as uh, shutter time but in the 1850s 1860s you're looking anywhere from a second or two to maybe even up to 30 seconds um that's one of the big uh that's one of the big um uh misconceptions that people have when they come to my studios they think oh is this one where you have to sit still for four or five minutes it's like no 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 it was it was never really that long maybe the very first baccarel style daguerreotypes which mm -hmm. weren't for portraiture anyway um but by the mid 1830s 1840s like they had already i think 1841 um or 1839 is the petsval lens is, is invented maybe 1840. so by 1840s you've already got a quick lens that's working well for portraiture so probably rarely shooting over 30 40 seconds 
Um, so once you've taken that exposure, it creates what's called a latent image. So there's an image on the plate, but our eyes can't see it. Um, so you can take the plate back into the dark room and the dark room isn't completely dark. Um, this whole process is pretty much dead to red light. And we'll talk about that a little bit later and how that creates some more ghostly, uh, uh, instances when you're making, uh, when you're making, when you're making photographs and how you can really bend that light and make right. it work for you. Um, but in the dark room, there's just a red light. And so that allows you to do the development process and watch the image come up. So you're going to pour um, glacial acidic acid, ferrous sulfate, and grain alcohol in a little mixture. And that's going to be your developer. And so that's going to bring up what we would consider a negative because um, it's inverted colors. You know, darks are white, whites are dark. Um, and then you stop that with water whenever you need it to be done. And then you can bring it out into the light. Now, the reason you can bring what looks like a negative out into the light is because technically it's a positive already. Right, um, correct. The difference is there's a final step, which modern photography doesn't really have, called fixing. And that's where we put it in potassium cyanide. And that's the cool part. That's the part where it swirls and you get to watch all the darks turn, you know, dark and the whites turn white and everything. And it's it reverses and flips and and, uh, and makes the image come out true it's to a, life. Yeah, that's I'm going to tell you, part. it's amazing. I mean, it, to sit there, you know, first of all, the whole process to me is like, again, it's fascinating. Now, Dave, mm -hmm. I, want to show, I want to show everybody one of the very first photo you ever did of me. This is now this is the very first one that I had Let's done do. at, at the portrait, and that's mm -hmm. that, that's it right there. And I mean that that's 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 I'll be honest with you. I've gotten so many I've gotten so many compliments on that one, and that's just a Grand Army of the Republic and, and our uniforms and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know that's that's what we, that's our parade uniform. But I want to show everybody. One of one of my more uh, how can I how can I describe it more of a, uh, a frivolous one, and that's this one. That is the great explorer that you did yes. for me. Yep, I, <laughs> I like still, that one a lot. I, I still laugh about that one. That's that's, that's <laughs> one of that that's that's I get a lot of compliments because that's on that's actually uh, on my uh, on my West African uh, collection cabinet. Mm -hmm. But the one yeah. that I have gotten the most compliments on, and this is the one I was, I, I, a lot of people, sh I, I actually use this one, uh, for, uh, uh, for advertising, you know, when I'm going to different places, I, I use it for advertising too. <laughs> and that's what I love. I love it. I love the fact that you do. I, I feel honored that you do really, but take a oh, look at you. this guys. Look at this. This is a spirit. This is a spirit photograph that he did of me, uh, probably just before COVID hit and mm -hmm. people look at that and they are just in awe because they just can't understand what is, you know, how it's done. And for me being a, first of all, being a spiritualist and being taught back in the day, Dave, the little old ladies used to use all those old Mumbler photographs as real proof. And we're, we're talking right, in the seventies, right. we're talking, yeah. you know, 1970s, early eighties. And they didn't know any better. And to have something like that in my collection of me is just mind blowing. It's just totally mind blowing. Now, you know, when we when we start talking about this, why do you think that photography as and I want to say an art form, but it started to become almost everyday uh, items. It be started to become uh, something that people wanted and and they were and we're not even going to talk about the death photography you know death photography right right mm -hmm. why did people just why did it become so widespread or did it become widespread uh on its own i think i think going from the difficulty of the daguerreotype to and now i'm not going to say that wet play clothing e is easy but the relative ease of, of wet plate collodion compared to daguerreotype really brought it into a usable medium, uh, especially in the United States. Uh, I mean, it kicks off. There's, there's two, there's two founders. Um, um, now I'm going to blank on their names, Talbot and uh, Archer that um, are, are the ones who kind of create the same process at the same time. And it does well in England, but it really, really takes off in the United States. Um, and 
you see a lot of practitioners of the medium being the ones that everybody talks about. You get Matthew Brady, you get Timothy O'Sullivan, you get Alexander Gardner, Ansel Adams, all those guys are shooting this type of, of stuff. And like westward expansion is going on. Um, there's so much of the Western United States that is unknown and sure lithographs are cool and drawings are great. And, you know, you know, Alfred Wode is doing all his work, but there's something just captivating about seeing an actual photograph. And even, you know, even now that we have great digital cameras, sure. That's cool and everything, but there's some, I don't know, there's some properties to a collodion photograph that just give it depth. I guess. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's hard. To, it's hard to describe. Yeah. It, to me, I mean, I've seen your photos of just regular people who aren't who aren't dressed up, who aren't, mm -hmm. you know, don't don't have historic garb on. And when you look at these photos, uh, it gives first of all, the shading, the grayscale is totally right. different from where you're black and whites. And right. it's not. I, I'm going to come out and say it's it gives them a rougher look. And to me, it looks like it's, it's almost peering into their soul. That's how, that's how deep it gets. And yeah. yep. you know, it, I, I, I see this and it's in, you know, you can, you can tell uh, the true person from those photos. I have yeah. seen, I think I forget who did them, but they did them up at uh, the Sunday up at Sundance uh, okay. yeah, years yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had, you know, you know, Robert Redford and, you know, right. Some of the other those. people. Yeah. And you see them and you see these people who we've known all our lives that have used filters and makeup, but you see mm -hmm. them in their natural state and right. you can understand who they are. Yep. And that yep. to me is amazing. Now, you know, Dave, I, I want to. Yeah. Colodian I, I, pulls no punches. Yeah. And I tell people that no. I was like, you know, this, if you've got blemishes, gray hairs, folds, wrinkles, whatever, this camera finds them. It finds them, every single one of them. But it does. There's something that's just, I, I prefer it that way. You know, I would absolutely just prefer it that way. Like I've, I don't really like photos of me, but there's a couple tin types of me that I'm like, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I look a lot older, but like, you know, I like it. There's something to it that just really kind of, it amplifies the imperfections, but in a good way, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's in a it's, real way. I think in a, in a real, real way. way. Yep. 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 And I, I think that's what's so important about it. And I think a lot of people don't get that. I think a lot of people know mm -hmm. being a kid that I went and I, let's say I, I spent my very first paycheck on a, you know, on a uh, SLR. I, I mean, at, at mm -hmm. my very, very first paycheck. And I took all, you know, I had, a, you're talking to somebody who had a dark room in his own basement. And right, right. Thing. It was something that was amazing. But yet even then, using different filters and different techniques in order to bring mm -hmm. out because i remember back then in order to make somebody look more more manly to bring out their pores you would use a green filter with black right, and white film right. this whole thing but the process that you use brings that and almost grabs you and pulls you in mm -hmm. to the you know to the actual photograph itself and that's what i always thought was amazing about it and again you're an artist with it you are you all right, the, the stuff, dude. The stuff that you do, and I and guys out there, I'm not waxing poetically with this guy. <laughs> he's good at what he does. He is true art. He's got the eye. You know, there's there's a lot of people that I've gone to, and again, we talked off the air. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of John Coffer that actually doesn't live too far away from him. Way back in the day, he was one of the first guys that I had ever met that did this process. And he would travel to all the different events and you know take photos, and it was it was just amazing. And I have to say, Dave, John is great. You eclipsed him. You really, truly do. You've eclipsed him because you can tell how much you've studied and how much you, you know, really, when you look at different photographs, the way you position people, right down to positioning people's hands, that always amazed me. Always, always, always amazed me what you do. Now, let's go into something that uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh the, the wonderful the wonderful world of William Mumler and William <laughs> Mumler is you know let's let let me just set the stage for this one Dave first of all William Mumler was a uh, he was a he was a photographer and uh, during this Victorian age and you know during the Victorian age we are assailed I guess that's the best way to say it. we're assailed with all these unbelievable 
industrial things that are going on and inventions and and uh, uh, people you know developing stuff and and it's like pushing it's pushing mankind forward at an alarming rate and one of the big things that i found studying the victorian times is that if science couldn't figure it out then we all know it was it was supernatural because both of them coexisted at that time at the same mm -hmm. the same period of time and uh we do know that in you know march 31st uh in 1849 the fox sisters got the wrappings on the wall right. at their cottage in hydesville and in hydesville new york which is not that far away from either one of us and no. uh it started to build from there and of course spiritualism almost died out before the civil war and then the civil war hit and it just exploded really but really ramped up after oh that, yeah, yeah but because mm -hmm. everybody wanted to make sure that their loved ones were Okay, right. you know, everybody because, knew somebody who had passed yeah. exactly yeah. entire Death towns just, men yeah. from entire towns disappeared yep. yep so uh it was all of a sudden these photographs became so important now along with it becoming important all of a sudden there was this phenomena that started which i'm not even going to go into different ghost shows that because having worked in reality tv myself i understand how some of this stuff works <laughs> yep, and some yep. of the side and some of the stuff is you know at, not gonna i'm not gonna mention names but uh all of a sudden there was all this need for proof and there were a lot of hucksters out there that were bringing mm -hmm. all these different things going and again that's how the ouija board started and all this other stuff right going right on. yep William Mumler, I think now, if, correct me if I'm wrong, he's the one that started the great fad of spirit photography. Was that, am I correct with that? Pretty, pretty much. He's, he's, he's the one who was the, I'll put it this way. He was the one who was most convincing that it could be real. Right. Um, there were plenty of others who were like, look, here's how I can make this happen because that's what I do. You know, I, I, I walk people through the whole process and how it's done. Um, essentially most ghost photos are a simple double exposure um it's actually easier for me to take a ghost photo with a wet plate collodion camera than it would be to use a digital camera in photoshop there's a lot mm -hmm. less steps in it. i can get it done in like 15 seconds and it's all done um it's really not that hard to figure out it's hard to master but um it's not that hard to figure out initially um i've even done some really cool ones um and i'll have to send it to tim to put up but uh i've done one where one person is both both subjects both the ghost and the solid subject and that's like really the, hard one like the lincoln like the the, yeah. the famous lincoln one mm -hmm. yep yep yeah so it's uh there's there's a lot you can do with it there's a lot of tricks you can pull but i think mumler's greatest trick was convincing people that it was real and he was pretty good at it and i think the craziest part of his whole story is that we're still not entirely sure how he did it um it's it's pretty obvious that he was doing it you know that he was doing it some way well, obviously he wasn't photographing ghosts but nobody's entirely sure exactly how he pulled it off and that's that's the craziest part and it the way it'll kind of walk itself into that conclusion as we talk about him more right but like it's 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 wild there's there's entire court cases that happened there's witnesses that are photographers that go and watch him there's you know people who are studying these images and he never gets convicted of it because you know they, nobody really knows like no and there's here's, uh, there's actually a lot Dave here and it's isn't this yeah. one of this isn't this the very first picture he did a self portrait is that and he claimed that it was a spirit and that there was, was in like the a girl behind him yeah 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 yep yeah yeah the, the little girl yep that is yep. what he that, claimed that, that he is. was just doing a test photo and this girl showed up that's it's amazing but what was what's really amazing is all the celebrities that either a someone like pt i have a picture here of pt barnum mm -hmm. uh who With probably Lincoln in the background yeah who probably didn't believe it but he wanted it anyway because of the fact that he loved the he loved oddities which right. i don't and he probably knew he could turn a dime on this too so oh wow well. hey that <laughs> listen listen if i could make little little cards out of the one that you made of me I'd be selling that one too, <laughs> right? But, right. <laughs> you can. I'll make it for you. <laughs> listen, listen. I'll give you a cut. We'll, we'll talk about hey, it. Sounds good. Cut. Sounds good. <laughs> but you had diehard spiritualists out there, such as 
you have right, right here on the on the left is Mary Todd Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And she believed that this photograph to the, her dying day was actually Abraham. Um, Fully believed. Yeah. yeah. And that and that's what's amazing to me when we start mm -hmm. looking at these photographs. Now, uh, OK, do you think Mumler did this just for monetary value or do you think that he was perhaps trying to be more of a sensationalist for himself or do you, do you think that maybe he was trying to go and maybe try to do it for the I, and i'll just throw this out there you know being a devil's advocate do you think he was just trying to go out there and and give you know a little solace to the grieving you know that there might be something life after death knowing what i know about mumler i don't think he was in it for anybody else <laughs> um i think <laughs> He saw an angle that he could play, mm -hmm. and he played it really, really well. In fact, he was, I believe, a typesetter, um, and yes, his was. wife was a silversmith, and then she became a photographer, mm -hmm. and then when he started courting her, he was like, so uh, you want to show me how that camera works? And then <laughs> it, it was her thing and then became his thing. Um, and then he claims, as he was learning how to do it, and testing the camera and, and practicing. That's how this ghost showed up. Um, I think he was trying, trying something unique. And I'll go into that a little later when I kind of explain what I, what I think he was doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't believe any of it obviously being, you know, a ghost of some sort, but I, yeah, I agree. he, he, he found an angle and there was a itch that needed scratched and he was uh he was he was there and he was ready to scratch that itch and there were plenty of people throwing money at him so well that's i mean you know again it's amazing because uh when we start looking at the at the time period and we seriously start looking at like the angles that everybody went out and and you know were involved in this ouija boards right never <laughs> never a true religious article although they tried to go and say it was tax exempt because it was religious but right right never never it's another way, another yeah, way it was never it was you know? never yeah it was never gone and uh you know presented like that you know uh it was always a monetary thing and it just kind of started to pick up along the way mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit real just briefly about the court cases the court cases are really fascinating because you would think even even towards the end the last court cases you would all you would they brought in like an army of specialists exactly that couldn't figure it out why why do you think that they, they couldn't figure it out why his process so the most fascinating thing to me is that um these specialists these other photographers would they, they would go and they would observe the photograph being taken but none of them went to the dark room with him and that's that that blows my mind that nobody went and followed him through step by step by step by step. Wow. They just wanted to make sure that there was nobody else in the room when it was being taken. Um, and that that baffles me that nobody stuck around to see how the final result was made, um, because and, and, and I may be wrong, but I don't think that there's any surviving Mumler glass plates. Now, um, I'll, I'll kind of elaborate a little bit. Um, all the Mumler photos that we see, um, at least that I've seen anyway, and I could be wrong here, um, they're all cabinet cards, CDVs. They're albumin prints of some sort. Right. Um, and for those of you don't, that don't know how an albumin print works, it's essentially a copy of a glass plate. Uh, to make an albumin print, you get uh, nitrated paper, you coat it with albumin and silver nitrate, and then you place a glass negative over that and then let the sun shine through it. And then that's going to bring out that kind of brown coffee toned image. All the mumblers that you see are these cabinet cards, which means there's glass plates somewhere. But I've never seen one. <laughs> and um, as far as I know, nobody has one. Um, the only surviving Mumler originals are um, uh, just these CDV cards. Um, right. Now, my theory, and I could be wrong, but from understanding how this process works, obviously he has to have two subjects somehow to get them on this uh, on this image. Um, Clearly, he's he's not doing, you know, obviously, Abraham Lincoln is not in the room with them or a cardboard cutout or anything like that, or even or even a lookalike. Now, what is very popular at that time is people buying glass plates. 
Um, Matthew Brady's making a killing off of this. Um, he's buying plates. He's recreating images and selling them. He found out that's where the money is. Shooting the originals, you can only sell those once. Shooting a glass plate and selling prints, you can sell them over and over and over and over. You're just printing money by that. Right. So photographers are are getting these copied plates, and they're turning around and making albumin prints and making copies and copies and copies. Um, they become the first almost popular trading cards. So getting his hands on a glass plate of a Lincoln wouldn't be that hard. Um, and I've never tried this before, but I'm pretty sure it'd be very doable, is to take um a glass plate of the subject that you shot in the studio and lay that on the al uh, on the albumin paper and let the sun shine through it and then at some other point either remove that plate and lay down another plate with you know lincoln or another ghost and leave that on for a fraction of the time and you'll get a faint ghostly image and then you've used two different glass plates to make one final paper copy um and i'm I can't say for sure, and I'd love to try it someday to see if it's even doable, which I'm pretty sure you could make that work. But that's kind of my theory on how he was pulling this off. Um, and he, you know, people are like, well, how did he cut it out so it fits around and everything? There's a process in in glass plates on um, amber types called relievio type, where collodion is essentially just kind of a kind of a thin film that sits on the plate it's not etched into the plate it's not etched into the glass it's not chemically you know fused with the glass or tin at all you can scrape that off and you can scrape off portions of it so that you've just got bits and pieces of your subject left um so if you've got your steady subject from the studio and then you can kind of lay that glass plate over them trace around it scrape off whatever you don't need and then lay that yeah. down well, yeah, that, then it would look like their hands are on their shoulders and you know their heads just right above theirs there's a way of doing it and i don't think anybody stuck around to see the magic behind the curtains i think they were all just looking to see what was going on in the studio and kind of drop the ball on the rest <laughs> well you know i mean let's face it i when you start looking at the psychical societies you start looking at all these all these scientists that are seriously researching psychic phenomena at that time, mm -hmm. going right up into the 1950s, there was a little bit of like, I won't say hanky panky, but I, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll just say that uh, a lot of them weren't exactly on the level. I mean, not everyone uh, was on the up and up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And even though that they were, re even though they were respected scientists, doesn't mean that they went and they. They were honest with everybody. And I know for a fact that that is like when you start seeing like crooks and you start seeing like other scientists looking and, and, and you know, especially when it comes to physical phenomena. Right. You start right. seeing that that change and why. Now, let me let me let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, whatever happened to Mumler? What eventually what happened? Did he did he just get like, you know, because I know that the spirit photography what was what's neat is i come across uh you know the stereo views i come across uh other people's works and you know i always wondered whatever happened to these photographers whatever happened to right. mumler so mumler's name although he doesn't get convicted of anything he gets kind of discredited and so he's kind of bumping from town to town and eventually after a while nobody's buying a shtick anymore um you know there's there's a handful of the ghosts in his photos that people can identify and they're like well i know that guy he's from in town you know it's like <laughs> this guy was clearly you know clearly a model at some point and that's the other thing as a photographer especially in the 1860s and late 1860s and 70s the glass plate um is usually kept by the photographer and they just sell the albumin prints uh there we go there's the albumin prints you can see all of these are those coffee toned uh photos and like let's uh like top uh one from the one from the left um with the man looking down and then the other woman um clearly that's just another image that he had sitting there and that he just trimmed out her, the bottom of her of her dress and she's at a weird cockeyed angle uh and that would kind of fit with my theory of he's just taking other glass plates and layering them over top and that's how he's getting these images now people don't realize now again in this day and age people don't realize how collectible these th these images were uh and not just spirit photography because right. 
uh, as someone who has, yeah, I mean, as you look around me, you can see all my photo, you know, my collection of photographs mm -hmm. from the American Civil War and afterwards. These were prized possessions of yeah. veterans, whether they were north or south or whatever, and they had full albums. And many people always, especially when they had regimental, uh, they had they had regimental uh, reunions, they would go and have these reprinted, so they yeah. could actually trade them with other, you know, with their with their comrades. So people don't get that. People a lot of times, you know, we're looking at a time when uh, there was no internet, there was no TV. You know, the big excitement was dime museums. Uh, right. I mean, huge. I mean, that was like, you know, wax. I mean, wax museums were like, were like second to none. People just like blew that just, just they lost their minds on mm -hmm. the very worst wax museums out there. But right. it was entertainment. And this is what people love. So mm -hmm. a lot of people don't get that. You know, so we have to take in order to under truly understand what we're talking about tonight. You have to really mentally take that step backwards you have to really take that step backwards in order to understand why they were so popular and why uh these spirit photographer or spirit photographs became so widespread and just yeah. became so and and let me tell and and you know what the costs of these the cdvs are now i mean you sit oh, yeah, down yeah. there I, I i had one that was not that good but it was a mumblers that mm -hmm. that i had found and it was half gone, and it was over five hundred dollars. It was half ripped apart. Jeez. I yeah. mean, it was just five. It was five hundred bucks. But you know, yep. of course, it had Mumler on the back, had the right, name, right. and that's and worth you it. Could, you know, yeah. You, I mean, and and I have to say that I was like two seconds. It was either not eat the rest of the trip, or <laughs> buy this. And I decided to eat because yeah, food is more yeah. food is very important. <laughs> to me. You know how it is. <laughs> you know, it's a long you know, it's though. just going to task it. You know, I want to ask you. Know, there aren't going to be more of them. Uh, there's, there's only a small right. fraction of them that exist, you know. And so many have, so many are lost. So many have been lost. Oh, yeah. Now, mm -hmm. what do you think happened to those, all those glass negatives? Because now I know, like with Brady and a lot, and I know a lot of them after they started to get to a certain age, the negatives, which are larger, people don't, re you know, people are thinking, you know, our, our film negatives, they're, they were much larger. Yeah, what they, they're the full a size lot of, of the plate. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, you know, I, I was shocked when I found out that gardeners and, and botanical gardens were, were buying them, scraping them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and reusing, reusing all these plates. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think ever happened to Mumler's plates? Do you think that maybe somebody got so a hold I, of them, destroyed I, I them think, or, or. I don't think many of them would be identified as a Mumler because I think he's using two different plates to True. make these images. You're right. So sure. Right. It looks like just, Mary Todd Lincoln with no Lincoln ghost peeking over her shoulder. So I think a lot of them you wouldn't be able to identify as mumblers unless you had both. Um, and you could put them together and be like, well, hey, here's this lady and here's this guy. And he's a sitting in this one and she's a ghost in that one. Right. Like, ah, I see the connection here. And I think that is what some people were doing was saying, well, Man, that ghost looks a lot like my neighbor who just had that same image struck, you know, a couple of years ago. I I really recognize that ghost. Um, like and you can tell some of them, some of them are very fuzzy and and deliberately opaque, and some right. of them are pretty sharp. You know, that's like, whoa, that's that looks that's an identifiable person, right? You know? And some of them are, I, you know, I believe intentionally vague. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not like. It's not like there's photo IDs back there. He could shoot a bunch in Boston and take them all to True. DC and make all his spirit photos there and, and vice versa. And nobody's ever going to know the difference. True. There's no You're right. There's You're be right. cross referencing to this. And I mean, nobody, and let's face it, you go and you, uh, you you shoot a picture and there's something there. Mm -hmm. You don't know what it is. And, all, and you have no clue. It could be anybody. And if it is a real picture, it still could be anybody. You know, it doesn't right. necessarily right. have to be. The person that you're really looking for. Mm -hmm. I've got I got a question here, real quickly, uh, from Joanne. Can you do a photograph like that for me, of my grandparents behind me? Yeah, I could probably do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll make sure that Joanne. I'll make sure that uh, uh, I'll get you his. I'll get you Dave's information. But also, if you want to check out his website at www.victorianphotostudio.com. Uh, You'll you'll see some more of the work that he does, which is um, mm -hmm. which is totally amazing. But yeah, I've he uh, uh, I was I was surprised when you were doing animals because 
you know, I figured, you know, when, when you start looking at the process with animals, almost always, unless they are the best trained animals or they're drugged, you know, right. <laughs> I mean, the tail's moving, the head's yep, moving, so you know, something's moving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you, I mean, it's a, I don't, well, maybe I don't want, maybe we shouldn't divulge how you do it. Oh, I don't mind sharing trade secrets at all. And in fact, I'm uh, I'm going to be on another podcast pretty soon um, about the sustainability of wet plate. And it's just going to be interviewing a bunch of wet plate artists. And I am strongly of the opinion that we wet plate artists should be sharing what we do and how we do it. None of us invented this. You know, we don't have a copyright on this process. You know, we don't have any claim to, you know, being practitioners of it. We're, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, we're stewards of a historic medium. And it's up to us I to agree. keep it going for, for more people. I agree. And, I agree. you know, I, I always tell people, like, listen, if you're earnest about really learning how to do this and you want to put in the work, I have no problem teaching you how to do this and showing you how to do it. Um, you know, obviously you want to come up and get your hands dirty and do it like you got to pay for the chemicals. But, you know, if you're just if you're just looking for advice. You can find me and I'm more than happy to help because I've done it every way that you can do it wrong. And so I'd be more than happy to tell you how to do it right. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, it's amazing because I, I've seen some of your photographs of, of animals and I've and, and being, a, a you know, someone who is interested in the Victorian age. I've seen so many of the uh, dogs and, and pets that have been photographed. Mm hmm. And I sit there and I go, I don't know how the hell you did it. And I mean, it's just, well, I, I do now. I'm not going to lie. I do. Mm -hmm. now. But I mean, it's your. It doesn't um, always work. <laughs> but, you know, but here's my wife, my lovely wife got on and said, Winnie needs her picture done by Dave. And you know what? We are we're not that he, far away. Let's pick a sunny no. day and do it. <laughs> I'm I would love it. I would absolutely love it. And I think it would be great. I think it would be great. And, mm -hmm. you know. The last you know. time I was in Iowa, I had a, a client who had a Pomeranian and they really wanted a tin type of this Pomeranian. I was like, I don't know. We'll try. And the first shot was not good, but um, <laughs> we fidgeted around. We kind of got things figured out how to do it. And we did it. Um, I've gotten very lucky most of the time with horses. Um, they don't always cooperate. I just did a gig. Uh, in Richmond, and then I went down to Williamsburg to shoot at a horse farm, and I think I was maybe like two for eight on horse photos. Um, they, it just wasn't my day. And you know what's surprising? All right, and I want you to guess of all the animals that I've done, that I've done multiple animals of. What do you think is the hardest animal that I've ever had to take a tin type of? Hardest animal? Oh my god! Uh I'm gonna be honest with you. I think I think any kind of like a farm animal. That would be like a like a sheep or, or a pig almost. Nope, those have like... been pretty good so far. I've done three of these now. And the hardest animal I've ever had to work with is a turtle. You would think really? of all the critters that couldn't run away, turtle would be, you know, the easiest one. Every right. time I've worked with a turtle, they scamper. And I've just struggled so hard doing turtle photos. I've done three of them now. I did one in Chicago, one in Pittsburgh, and one in That's Boston. Amazing. That's and amazing. every single time I've struggled with turtles, you know, dogs, cats, horses. I've done an emu. Uh, you know, I've had a whole bunch of animals and uh, sheep I've done, ducks, geese, chickens. The hardest one I've ever had to do was a turtle. And I couldn't believe it. This woman brought up full tortoise i was like cool set it down and i'll take care of it boom as soon as it hit the grass it was gone i essentially had to have her like lay down and hold it by the tail so i could get it in focus and then as soon as we were ready she let go i did the lens and i had to put the aperture wide open to do like a one second shot it still came out a little iffy like i couldn't believe it i was like sure bring bring any because i had already done a rabbit that day and a guinea pig and then somebody brought a turtle my like, good finally an easy one Nope. Wow. Toughest one wow. I've ever done. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hey, I got a I got a good question here for you. Mm -hmm. Now Kenneth is a good friend. He's a spiritualist. And he goes, Have you ever seen a legitimate spirit wet plate photo? That's I mean, I'm let me answer first. I'll answer first. Go ahead. I have never seen a legitimate one. I have seen a lot of of orbs and I've seen a lot of that, you know black masses we don't know mm -hmm. what the hell that is i mean there's a i've seen a lot of things that could be 
especially because everybody takes them with cell phones now. We're talking right, about plastic right. lenses. We're talking about this and that and yeah, so yeah, much, yeah. you know, and, the, and you know, that There's so uh, much digital manipulation that you can yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have taken two. I've never taken what you would call a spirit photo that is legitimate, where it's like, oh, that's a person. I have taken in my studio a photo of a woman named Catherine. And I'll have to put this, I'll send this photo to you because I am what you might call a skeptic <laughs> as far as, you know, you have to be. ghosts and stuff like that. You have I'm, to be. You have I to lean be. a little harder on the skeptical side. We had just gotten finished talking about her ancestors who lived on the Gettysburg fan, uh, battlefield over at the, I'm going to, uh, the Wetzel farm and okay. the George Wetzel okay. farm. Right. We took a, we took a photo. I took the photo myself. It's a wet plate photo. She's just in a gray dress with a black skirt and right smack in the middle of her dress are like three or four perfect concentric rings, like glowing orb rings, like right in the middle of her dress. And it's inside the collodion. So it's not a chemical drip. It's not refracted light. It's not right. I, I've been trying. I can't reproduce it. I can't get rid of it. Like I couldn't wipe it. You know, sometimes when you're shooting wet plate, you'll get a fog or something like that. And you oh, can yeah, wipe yeah, that yeah. or, you know, or something else. This is, this was captured. It wasn't you know, a chemical oddity. I tried to explain it any possible way that I could. I was like, well, maybe I dropped a drip of developer. I was like, but it wouldn't be perfect concentric rings like that. Mm -hmm. Like it's wild. So as far as I know, I captured an orb on a wet plate camera and I didn't do it on purpose. And I've tried to explain every possible way that it couldn't be what it might be but um i'm i'm a skeptical photographer and i took that photo and that's what i got and uh there's there's no trickery involved and i didn't mean to do it so um that's an interesting one uh yep, the other one is. that i did that i'll send to you was shot in hollywood cemetery in richmond um and a friend of mine lauren is leaning laying down next to a gravestone and there is a fog mist coming up from the ground right from one of the graves that she's leaning next to now this was a very humid rainy day in richmond the temperature was like 60 ish degrees mm -hmm. that tends to put a lot of fogging on your plates um you know it's like oh this is explainable there's fogging on this plate i'll wipe it i wiped all the other fogging but not this ghost that, you know, ghost that was coming up from the ground, the fogging in the corners, the fogging across her dress, all of that wiped, but not our little friend. So, you know, that's twice now that I've shot something that shouldn't be there where I've done every step of the chemical process. And I know I didn't do anything different. Um, there it is. You know, it's, you know, it's it, the one thing I have to say is a good skeptic is very skeptical because they can explain it, but they're also open-minded enough to sit there and say, I don't understand it. I, right yeah. now, science can't, we can't explain it, but it's also a good believer should also be a good skeptic because this way it takes you out of the realm of being in a cult because right. I right. have, because I have run into, you know, and no, I the mean, orb cult comes out every night in Gettysburg. <laughs> it's nuts. Of yeah. course, you're taking flash photography in the middle of the night. You're gonna get orbs. Oh my god! I can yes. do that anywhere. <laughs> you know, it's it's to me it's amazing because Gettysburg. For those of you who have not been in Gettysburg yet, my wife and I were talking about this recently. That when I mean I used to go, I've been going down there since I've been nine years old, and I'll be sixty six this year. So I mean, you know, my wife and I when we got married we used to go down there all the time, and it was before the onset of all the ghost stuff. Yeah. Now yep. don't get me wrong, I absolutely love all the ghost stuff. <laughs> But the amount of traffic, if you sit at the, if you sit and have a drink at, at, at the Farnsworth house in the, in the beer garden, all yep. you see are tours going back and forth all night and, long. and yep. all you see is the flashing and everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I often think to myself, wow, you know, if I had only known this, 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 I, I would have retired for, because I think yeah. I could, you know, I could fit right easily, in doing some of that easily. stuff. You don't even have to have any true stories you can make stuff up all night oh my you know? god well that's oh my god that's another that's another thing that's another thing 
I uh, I've been at my studio late at night mixing chemicals or whatever and have the windows open and I'll hear ghost tours going by and occasionally they'll stop and they'll tell haunted stories about my studio. Oh, and it was a hospital and there's a ghost here, blah, 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 blah. My building was built in 1904. <laughs> Nothing happened there. It didn't exist during the battle. <laughs> you know, there's, it, and it's on a section of the battlefield where literally nothing happened. Right. So, you know, right. You know, sure, you know, soldiers walk through there, but that's it. You know, they walk through this whole town. Know, but people, but, you know, I, I think, I, I think we're seeing a resurgence of that Victorian time. And it, I think mm -hmm. it's, uh, I don't believe it's just a fad because I know, I mean, being again, being involved with everything with TV and being involved with some of the, you know, some of the main players, I'm seeing like, you know, the believability people want to believe, you know, I think, yes. it, you know, I've worked, I worked with uh, Jack Osborne and mm -hmm. uh, he had a great show along with everything else he does was the Osbournes want to believe. And I thought to myself, and that's what kind of triggered it for me because people want to believe. And yeah, yeah, it, definitely. And yep. most of the people now, back in the early days, you go back to the 125th anniversary, even the 130th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Right. People were more history oriented. More. Right. I want to know. And Mark Nesbitt was writing all these great little pamphlet books about mm -hmm. the hauntings that he would collect. But now it seems the, re the roles have reversed, where people yes. are down there for the the ghosts and not. Yeah. The history of it and, and and to me being someone who lo loves both i i i kind of have a problem a little bit with it you know i mean not to the mm -hmm. point where you know i i say you know get rid of it all but I, it, it's sort of i wish that the scripts that these people would come up with were a lot more believable or if they even just there's so much real hit, real unique things that have happened in this town that they could easily go off of. Oh I my mean, God. Yeah. There's, there's so the Amos Humiston photo and like Jenny Wade and, and, uh, Jack Skelly and, and, um, yes, uh, yes. The cult boy, Wesley Culp. Tell those stories. They're real. They actually happen. You can take them to the places they happened. Oh my you God. Know, you can, you could show where Amos Humiston was killed and then you could walk to his house. And Amos, <laughs> and Amos Humiston actually was not that his, his regiment was uh, uh, formed not too far away from where we live right here in Western New York. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, what happened was, is they found an unified, uh, unidentified body with a uh, grasping a photograph of three children. And mm -hmm. they reproduced that photograph. And finally, over time, it got to where it was in the newspaper and his yep. widow saw it. And they were able to go and and identify where Amos was is is buried. Well, to this day, yeah. and it's amazing because they can you can go and you can follow it. Or even in the in the Culp's field uh, of the, the outside of the Culp's house, uh, we were in the uh, National Museum of the Civil War, where a veteran found a hip bone and made mm -hmm. it into the top of a cane. Yep, you know mm -hmm. a cane topper. Yep. So yeah. I mean, these are a lot of these are are really you know they're really gruesome or if you start really getting into if you really start getting into like the gruesomeness of it where you know you've got the you've got a wounded confederate soldier that half of his head is blown off and he's he's on autopilot walking around back and forth you know i mean mm -hmm. these are things that are true or when they're digging up the graves afterwards because this because the uh farmers right. are already like everyone. yeah mm -hmm. yeah we yeah. want to you know i want to get this guy you know i want to get these people out of my field so i can grow yeah. grow crops and they're digging them up and throwing them and stuff the story of the reclamation and identification of all the bodies on the battlefield. Yeah. That's a great story. And it's insane how detailed it is and how like there were only a handful of bodies that nobody ever found. Like almost everybody mm -hmm. was accounted for. It's nuts. Um, actually, uh, there's a I, I, I have one. I know one mm -hmm. that isn't accounted for. It's actually my great, great grandfather's brother. No that, was killed, that was killed in the wheat field and they uh -huh. never found, they can't, they never found his body. He searched, him, yeah, he yeah. searched on July 2nd for it and, uh, never found it, but then my family lore says that because it, it was near the artillery, so it looks like the artillery caissons may have ground the body into the ground and, and deformed Could it. Be. So, Could you know, be. he's, he's, he's probably, but most of them are all, yeah, they're probably in the unmarked grave section, yeah. But mm -hmm. a lot, but you know, I think, I think what everybody's doing is they're looking for the thrill ride of it, yes. And yeah. to me, I would, there to me, history has so much of this in there. Plus, on top of it, you've got, you know, all the 
you've got the uh, uh oh i can't in the first day's battle i can't think of the, the, the confederate burial pits that are out there that, oh yeah 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 up on the uh northwest side of town yeah right yeah. i mean if you go and you stand and you just look down at that field you can actually and the sun's just right you can actually point out where the burial pits actually were you can and, do that them too yeah yep. yeah mm -hmm. yep. but you know i think that's i think that's a big problem with yeah. what's going on but yeah. uh, i love again not not no i'm sorry <laughs> Sorry, we saw a squirrel. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Dave and I saw a squirrel, and we just went up. We just went <laughs> we go way down. I didn't even tell you that I lived in the in Henry Culp's farm when I lived in Gettysburg, and I've no. got all kinds of crazy Wesley Culp theories and stories. Yeah, oh yeah, I could go way. I've got a, I got a, I got a wild. It's, it's not for this show, but I got a wild Wesley Culp conspiracy theory. <laughs> so. Oh, we then you know what, Dave? We have to we have to book you again because I I yeah. think that's 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 going to be phenomenal. People just I'll, love. I'll give you I'll give you the abridged version. So, okay. so uh, Henry uh, Wesley Culp grows up in Gettysburg, moves to Shepherdstown, Virginia, now West Virginia, right before the war starts, enlists in the Confederate uh, regiment. He, at the Battle of Third Winchester, runs into some captured soldiers from the 87th Pennsylvania, formed in Gettysburg, Adams County, runs into his old buddy Jack Skelly. Jack right. Skelly says, "Hey." I know I'm probably never making it back to Gettysburg. If you ever get there, here's a letter for my girlfriend. Okay, cool. If I ever get there, I'll bring it up. Little does he know he's on his way to Gettysburg with Lee and, and the you know the Pennsylvania campaign. Right. Gets up there. The girlfriend is Jenny Wade. Um, so the interesting part about Wesley Culp is that nobody knows where his body is. Um, there's a couple stories. Uh, this, the official story from his regiment is that they were assaulting Culp's Hill because he ends up in his, in his uncle's own backyard right. and he's assaulting his uncle's hill and, um, he gets shot and killed there. Um, they say that he's got a unique, uh, sh uh, rifle because he's so short they had to cut the shoulder stock down. Um, so his compatriots say he was killed. We couldn't drag him back because the Federals were, were taking, you know, retook the positions. Right, we couldn't right. get him. Yeah. Sorry, but we carved his name in his rifle and leaned it against a tree. You'll be able to find him some other time later. A couple things don't sound right to that. A, the Federals never moved forward on Culp Hill. They just defended the entire time. Right. They um, dug in. They dug it. At, they dug in at the top. Exactly. They never yeah. advanced. They pulled back a little bit, but the Federals never. Right. I mean, the Confederates didn't even get within like 100 yards of federal positions in most cases, other than like the Pardee field. Um, but that's not where Wesley Culp's uh, uh, regiment was at. Right. Also, he was a small little guy. They could have brought him out. Also, if they didn't have time to bring him out, how did they have time to carve his name in his musket and leave it there? His uh, cousins went out to go find him. They couldn't find him anywhere. Um, so there's a couple theories. Either A, he did get killed and uh, the cousins either buried him somewhere else and told people, oh, we didn't know, I don't know yeah. where he is. People wouldn't be thrilled if he was buried somewhere in town. You know, the, the neighbors weren't happy that those culps went to Virginia. I have a theory that he knew now that Jack Skelly is out of the picture, him and because uh, uh, in the middle of the night on July 2nd, he went into town to go find Jenny Wade and give her this letter, um, but supposedly didn't find her. She was across the street, you know, with another family or something like that. So supposedly they missed each other at night. I posit that they did talk to each other that night and then just ran away together. You know what? I, Dave? <laughs> They, it's a dumb you know what? Theory, but that's what Gettysburg's full of. <laughs> you know what? You know, next time I go down there, I'm going to mm -hmm. go to the Jenny Wade house. I'm going to rent the Jenny Wade house out with my friends, uh -huh. and we are going to go because the Jenny Wade house is actually it's a, it's a small house, but it's split down the middle. I'm mm -hmm. going to go on the side where Jenny Wade had lived, and I'm going to go and let's. I'm going to go and do an EVP session or a box or a box session. And mm -hmm. I'm going to go and I'm going to ask those questions because I have never <laughs> thought of that. I want to know. I'm, well, you know, that's, that's your now, thing. They, get, they, we have they to put go her now. in a casket real fast and then buried her quick and then reinterred her somewhere else. Right. Like she got buried twice. Right. And but that's that was common. suspicious. Well, no, that, was, that was common. That's suspicious that's, about how quickly they did it too. Didn't they? Didn't um, they bury her? Didn't they bury her like like close by to the house? And then they then they exhumed the body and they took her to the net where the, put the cemetery where the, the cemetery is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And where she's she the now. only civilian casualty of the entire battle. That to me is that suspicious. Of are, 
real suspicious, you know, and yeah. there's this other kid who just all of a sudden disappeared. And like, if you wanted to disappear in this time, you could go one town over and just tell them you're a different name. Yeah, well, yeah, you, nobody had ID. They could have that... gone as far as Littlestown and it wouldn't have mattered, <laughs> you know. But so, that's true. Yeah. But that's, that's true. That's my that's my completely unfounded Jenny Wade theory. So. Well, we're gonna. I'm gonna listen, Dave. I'm gonna find out for you. When <laughs> I next, I'm, I swear to God, next time I go, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> it's gonna so. be like an episode of Maury. <laughs> it's like we know what you did. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> we finally hey. figured you out. Listen, so long so long as nobody decides to come home with me on that one, I'll, I'll be good. If not, I'm Sounds sending I'm, I'm sending them down to the Finger Lakes looking for you. Sounds good. You can come find me down there. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, actually that's excellent. I love that, Dave. We're hitting the end of the show. Tell mm -hmm. everybody how they can get a hold of you, how they can you know find you, uh, what's going on down in Gettysburg, uh, and he my even though Dave is. Dave, Dave is here in New York State now. He's 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 an Excelsior guy now. I snuck out. <laughs> he snuck out. Listen, but he's still got the ties, and he has an excellent person down there, excellent photographer who is picking up his slack. I'm just gonna say he's pick up his slack. How's that? Um, yeah. So tell everybody how they can how they can uh, you know figure what's going on and get a hold of you and and seriously get some hardcore beautiful photographs that you Thank will you. treasure forever. I'm just telling you right now, you'll treasure these forever. Sounds good. Uh, the best way you can find us, um, especially if you want to do a ghost photo yourself, is to come to our studio location in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're located at 76 Steinware Avenue, right across the street from the Dobbin House, um, right there on the main drag. Um, you can come see my studio manager, Kim, and my assistant, Brandon, and they'll be more than happy to put you in period Victorian clothes and take your tintype and uh, do a ghost photo if you're interested. Um, you can also find me on Instagram. Uh, my handle is at VPS underscore Gettysburg, and that's going to have my travel schedule. I hit the road for, I think I've got 25 gigs this year all over the U.S. Um, I'll be mainly up in New York, New England, uh, the upper Midwest, and a little bit of the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, spending a couple days in Philly this year, Pittsburgh, Boston, Connecticut. We're going to be all over the place. Um, so if you're looking for me to come to you or somewhere close to where you're at, um, check out our uh, check out our Instagram page where I'll have all of our travel schedule and all of our dates. Um, we go everywhere. Um, also, if you're looking for photos done right up here in like the Rochester Finger Lakes area, I've got a studio at my farm. I also do workshops. If you're looking to learn how to do wet plate collodion, I offer workshops at my Gettysburg location and I offer private workshops here at my farm in uh, Phelps, just north of Geneva. This is awesome. Guys, I am so thrilled. You don't know how honored I was that when I got a hold of Dave, and this is the way fate works. This is the way fate works. <laughs> I was just going to ask. <laughs> it, it, it was like, who am I going to, who can I bring on? And I said, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask the person who created these beautiful images. And I, I just called, I think it was on a Sunday, I think. And uh, it was a random Sunday. Yeah, yep. just a random Sunday. And I said, well, I'll just leave a message. And this dude picks up the phone. He goes, yeah, this is Dave. And I went, I, I, you know, because I was It wasn't even during our open hours either. <laughs> no. And then, you know, so we started talking and he's, you know, yeah, I know all about Mumler and we're doing this. I can explain it really well. And I said, fantastic. And then you told me you live in New York State. And this was like, what? Once a month, you're in Gettysburg. <laughs> Not even. It's usually once every three months or so. I, I get back down to Gettysburg. It had. It was the only time I had been there since like November, and I think you wow. called me in January. It was right. just happened to be the only day that I was in town, and I was I was already supposed to have left already, but I stuck around a little bit longer just to get a couple of more things tied up. We was already past our closing hours or whatever, or before. I can't remember. It was not during our open hours. And normally right. I don't answer the phone during non-business hours. But I was like, eh, I'll, I'll pick up. You know, I, I haven't picked up the office phone in like a year. I'll pick it up and see what's going on. <laughs> and it just happened. And, you know, uh, he said, oh, no, this is, you know, uh, Tim Shaw. I've, I've done. I was like, oh, yeah. I remember you. I've done your ghost photo. And you're like, oh, perfect. <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, you blew me away because I was just yeah. like, I'm here. Here I am. I've got I've got a whole spiel. I got this whole I spiel in three years, I don't think. So, <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. So it was it was just great. So 
but stick around for a couple seconds and i want to thank you properly off the air because sure this is thank phenomenal... you so much for having me on tim it was great oh, it's so great and thank you for the culps the, the culps conspiracy because <laughs> you can spread that around anywhere you oh, want i, I, oh, are I you... love it Next time, listen. I'm already going to tonight before I go to bed. I will start with the questions. I will. Perfect. I will already start to get down there and we'll figure. I'll figure out all the proper things to say. So that's my. It's my favorite, like slightly believable conspiracy. It's like, I well, it. yeah. I mean, I guess if they never found his body, never found. Don't know what happened to her body. I'm like, yeah, I guess that that really could have worked. So. I, hey, listen. We better watch out because next time I'm up at the. Uh, uh, the in 1863 in next door mm-hmm. to the uh, Jenny Wade house. I'll be sitting there on the on the veranda smoking a cigar, and I'm going to hear the people below me in the, the tour. Card, yeah. They're going to they're going to say this. They're going to talk about the well, possibility some people of... that her and Wesley Colt may have run away together. Oh my god, <laughs> that's my dream is to get one of my made up conspiracy series circulated in the dumb ghost tours. <laughs> well, you, just quickly, you know what? I, I was interviewing a gentleman that did Civil War games. He created Civil War mm-hmm. games, so he needed a name of a messenger. Mm-hmm. He created a messenger. One day he's reading a book and then they used his made up messenger name in the book. So that's, that, that, that gives you an idea of how these things work. You know, it's, it's wild how some of these things just grow legs and and pick up steam. Yeah. It's nuts. (laughs) Hang on, buddy. I will be, I'll be right back. And uh, I'm just going to do a little quick closing. Guys again. Was this not an amazing show? He is probably one of the most, learned he's probably one of the most interesting and he's one of the greatest artists that i've ever i've ever got a chance about when it comes to photography history and it's just amazing so i look forward to hanging out with him in the near future now in in the meantime everybody stay well stay happy we'll see you next week tuesday as we continue our victorian march madness and i think you'll enjoy the show ciao babies be good We're all hanging out. Where else at the Black Cat Lounge where the elite meet? Where else? Next to the dumpster transfer station. Take care. Bye-bye.